for sports went live nationally on the world's largest sports network. On that evening, the 100 million American homes that receive ESPN2 programming were able, for the first time ever, to see, hear, and feel live sports as if they were at the event. Using their patented broadcast technology, the engineers at Gidhammer have worked closely with the on-site production crew and enabled it to produce an NHRA telecast with an enhanced tactile feed. The process involves sensors that are mounted on the race cars. These sensors capture, live, and in real time, the actual vibration and the tactile energy that the driver is feeling and that the fan is a trackside experience. Here is the RF antenna that receives the tactile data in real time from the on-car sensors from over a half mile away. The sensors allow the fan to become part of the action. When the signal from the sensor is added to the NHRA television broadcast, the fan at home is able to get that same experience of going 300 miles per hour in 4 seconds at 10,000 horsepower. When the viewers at home, they're sitting there watching the show, watching an event, and they say, Woo! Yeah, you know, we got it right. <laughs> what do race teams think this new technology will mean to their sport? Rob Wendland, crew chief for funny car driver Johnny Gray, just found out about this technology and had to try it out for himself in his own home.
making the devices and grabbing the sensor stuff off the cars, but they don't know how to put it in the video to make it survive the video broadcast chain. So they've developed some kind of a proprietary method which worked in that local case, but they came to us and said, we need some help in terms of encoding this in so that it makes it through the whole food chain and uh, into the home. So um, there was a project kicked off and it hasn't really started yet, but um, basically they're trying to get an end-to-end -end technology that allows this um, tactile um, or haptic information to be carried along with the video. So this is how they envision it. You've got the, the capturing or the sensors. You have to encode that information somehow. You have to transport it. Then you have to decode it. And they're, they're, they came to simply for the encoding and the transporting and the decoding part. Any questions? Any more questions? Where do I buy my butt kicker? Oh. Just for general interest, what's simply doing about 3D? There is still some work being done in 3D. Um, so there's a project that you and I are both involved in which is to do with uh, 3D production. There's not a lot of 3D production being done anymore. Um, so I'm not totally sure where that's going to go. Um, but there is still, certainly there's 3D stuff in the cinema. Uh, there's work that's been done on uh, 3D uh, caption offering and stuff like that. And this work that Paul and I were involved in was to do with 3D production keeping the left eye and right eye in sync with each other. All right. Good one. Well, one more question at the back there. Alan, is yeah. there an update you could provide on uh, Simply 2022? Jeez. Uh, you can talk about that? That's yes, that nice lead into my stuff. Uh, okay. Alan, wait. Alan, thank you so much for your contribution. We appreciate you coming. Thank you very, very much. So after uh, Alan's uh, intro there on the uh, on the standards stuff, so how many people are going to run out and uh, join the standards committee and uh, start working on standards? You know? It's actually fun. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with the easy question. So how many people have read a standard before? Okay, that's good. So how about how many people are going to come out to March down in Niagara on the Lake to learn about standards? Hmm? Well, remember, nice and close. Oh, the big one, maybe? Ice one, maybe, oh, the winter? Why? Okay, so I'm going to uh, now talk about some network standards, and I'll get to your question on the 2022 there. Um, quick introduction for those people who don't know me. Uh, thankfully, we come here. Um, I've been a, a designing products for 23 years now. I've been at, uh, originally was uh, Leech Video, then became Harris Broadcast. I'm a uh, principal engineer there. Um, I've got two patents and an application. Um, Graduated uh, from Waterloo in 91 and did a master's at U of T in 2006. I've been a Simpty manager for I think about five, maybe six years now. And I've been very involved with the Simpty standards program, um, do a lot of work on the network standards. And I'm going to have a curve. Okay, so network, or, uh, networking update. So we've had the tradition, the transition that's starting here going from coax to IP. Um, so why is Simpty involved? Well, in, the I, in IT, there's lots of IT networks everywhere. However, when it comes to professional media networks, so these are the networks that we would um, deal with, dealing with sort of live contribution, production, post-production, dealing with sort of media essence, audio, video, metadata, synchronization, control, um, there's not as many sort of best practices and, and good definitions. Um, and we want to have sort of interoperability so that you can buy from one manufacturer to another, and sort of Simpty can help help in this area. And also within the Simpty manufacturer and the user base, there's a large amount of sort of knowledge and expertise. Because once we get into sort of networking, things become very complicated, there's lots of system level stuff, and so you need to sort of think these things through. So Simpty is sort of a good organization to help sort of standardize and help the users um, come up with sort of solutions. Um, so as we move from standard or from 
SDI based into IP based. There's lots of challenges because we've got our equipment on the side like before, but you've got this big mess in the middle. You've got how do you encapsulate the data? How do you route it? How do you break it up? How do you deal with lost packets? Um, quality of service, routing is done differently. So there's lots of, lots of different challenges as we move to IP. And for sort of SIMPI, it's also a little bit different because most of SIMPI standards deal with sort of very specific areas where this is actually dealing much more at system level. So last year, uh, when you gave it up, or I gave it up, I mentioned these, this media productions systems networking architecture, bit of a mouthful, uh, study group. It had started um, in late 2012, so when I gave an update, it was sort of just early in its work. And it's basically looking into sort of providing an introduction to the broadcast plan, because lots of IT people don't understand what's sort of special about the sort of the professional media networks that, that we deal with. Um, looks at some of the use cases, some success stories that have been going on, helps characterize what a professional media network is, and has some sort of guidelines and it's going to produce a, some conclusions and further action. So this group is just wrapping up. Um, they've got their, um, which I sort of participated in this, we have our last editing session this Friday, and then at the March meeting that everyone's going to come out to, um, they're going to be sort of presenting some of the results. So this study group is just wrapping up, but we should be seeing their, their work. It's about a 50-page report that should be coming out very shortly. The plan is to publish it before now. And the plan is to publish it before now, so it's very, very close to being done. Alan had mentioned about um, some of the different groups that work with SIMTI. So there, when you come to sort of networking standards, there's lots of groups that can be involved. And so here's a, uh, there's a joint task force which is set up between the EBU, um, SIMTI, and this video services forum, the VFS. Uh, VFS, those people don't know, it's sort of an international association dedicated to the transport technologies, interoperability, quality metrics, and education. And so different standards groups here, we don't want to step on each other's toes. So here's a um, sort of a joint uh, task force sort of looking into professional network streaming media. Um, and they have a um, mission statement. I'll just let you guys read that yourself so it's a bit of a mouthful. You mean this is separate from the previous activity? This is yes, activity. no, this is a different activity. So it, it does, it does have a certain amount of overlap, um, but there are they are two separate ones. So this this first one here is a purely SIMPTI activity, although it does have some of the same people. But it's um, this is kind of the well, this what's on the screen is sort of the focus of this group. Um, this one covers it a slightly different way, and so this task force um, has been moving at sort of quite a I'll say breakneck speed. Um, they they started at sort of NAB in 2013, so last year. They compiled a bunch of user requirements. They put out, they issued a request for technology at IBC last year. Um, now the requirements list is quite small, it's like about a 15 page document. They, they had 27 companies uh, respond with technology proposals for the, for the request for technology. And then in December of last year, so only uh, nine months after the group started, uh, they published a gap analysis report, and now they're sort of looking to what the next steps would be. Um, if you're interested in these documents, um, if you go to those websites, like on the SIMTI website, you can do a search for the, uh, the Joint Task Force um, or the EBU, you know, these documents are available. So the, uh, the gap analysis, if you want some light reading, is only 117 pages. Anyway, so that's some work that sort of just, just happened last year. So the task force was sort of started and is basically done. One of the work that uh, the VSS was working on uh, last year I sort of presented, they had a technical report, or sort of te technical recommendation they came up with, the transport of JPEG 2000 broadcast profile video and MPEG 2 TS over IP. Um, they've now done some interoperability testing, so they've had two um, interop sessions and actually um, in a couple weeks um, at the VidTrans, they're actually going to be doing a demo of some interoperability going on. Anyone here going to VidTrans? One. Okay. Anyway, if you're there, you'll see a demo of, of some interoperability work that's been going on. So, not SIMTI, but a, a sort of a, a, 
an aligned standards group. Okay. So the question on 2022. So 22 is a family of standards which Cinti has. Um, the ones on the screen here are, are older ones, so I don't really comment much because it's not really an update on these ones. But these ones are, are sort of covering uncompressed, but they're, they're covering compressed video over IP. So in terms of the, the newer ones now, the, there was an uncompressed Ford error correction um, update there. After people started implementing the standard, um, people started to find, oh, unfortunately you put all this effort to try to make sure you got everything right, but unfortunately you don't. So a few things weren't completely correct, or there was a few things which weren't as clear as they could have been. So an update was done to the, the Dash 5, which is the Ford error correction for basically uncompressed video. And then the new one that's come out here is the Dash 7, which came out last year, which is seamless protection switching of 2022 IP datagrams. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, for anyone who's sort of following the standard stuff, this was also called hitless at one point, but then at the last second it was renamed to seamless. Um, just a quick overview for those people who don't aren't familiar with the 2022 family. So Dash 2 and Dash 6 are basically how you take your, your video and break it up into chunks to make it into IP packets. So it just sort of describes how you group up transport stream um, TS packets in the case of compressed or how you split video into 1376 byte chunks. And the standard goes into how you encapsulate it. So you take your video signal, you put it with RPT, R RTP header around it, you put an IP header around it, you put an IP header around it, you have an Ethernet header, so lots of levels of wrapping. Unfortunately, in our IP packets, we have loss, unlike in our SDI, where we get one bit causes little small little hits, in IP, little single bit errors cause packets to get lost, which can be fed thousands of samples, which can be quite large breakups. In dealing with that, we've got the four error corrections. So we have the four error correction standards. So the dash one, which is for compressed, or the dash six, which is for uncompressed. Um, so it basically just takes the video and makes this array of packets. And when the packets get deleted, it uses this XORing scheme to help recover it, which has some sort of good and bad things. It's good that you can recover your packets, it's bad that it adds latency and overhead. So one new standard that's come out last year, the, the Simply 2022-7, which is a seamless protection, what it's basically doing is you're sending two copies of it. So sending the same information down two separate paths, and then the receiver gets these two streams, all is good, it gets duplicates of all the packets, and it, one packet's missing, it became confused from one path one path to the other. Um, all seems easy, but once you get into the details, how big are your buffers, and how do you align these, and once you get into the details, that's what sort of the standard jumps in. So it's basically, it's a different way of how to deal with the error management. So you've got the dash one and dash five dealing with adding forward error correction, and then an alternate way is doing this dash seven, which is a duplicate stream. Okay. So that's it on the sort of, well, on the main NECA one. So looking at a quick one on the, our reference system of today, and it's a little more complicated. So as we want to move to IP, we have our Genlock standard, which we've sort of talked about last year. Um, just a reminder, so that's SIMD 2059, which is basically doing a distributed Genlock black burst stars time code over an IP network, um, which is one. We're building this on the um, IEEE 1588. And it's actually a family of standards, much like the 2022. So you've got, and unfortunately the order doesn't seem to say follow, is that so you've got the dash two standard, which is, so last year we were sort of hammering out the high level details. So, so the update for this year is we've actually now put paper to, or pen to paper and actually written the draft standards. So the dash two is basically how do you get time to the device, and this is a profile, um, so anyone knows about 1588, there's these things called profiles, and so the dash two dis defines a SIMPTE profile. So there's a telecommunication profile, there's a power profile, and so we have a SIMPTE profile. 
the dash one document then takes, now I've got time in my device, how do I generate all my signals? So how do I generate video? How do I generate audio? How do I generate time code? And so that's the dash one document. And then there'll also be some engineering guidelines that are gonna come along with that. So there's a, a dash 10, we skipped a few numbers. So dash 10 is gonna be an engineering guideline to help implementers and, and system designers in terms of setting up the systems to use this. So where are we at? Um, so the first two documents have gone to final committee draft or FC ballot. Um, so then basically it goes out to a whole bunch of people, they provide comments. So we're in that the comment resolution stage where we have to answer all the comments. Depending on the comments, we might have to go through this again. Cross your fingers, we won't. Then it goes to a draft publication. So simply being a standards organization is a certain flow we have to follow, make sure everyone gets their input. So draft publication will be the next step. We'll go through another comment resolution, and then we'll publish the document. So I don't know what we say. Hopefully later this year, Paul. Alan? Sure. Sure. <laughs> it's been going on for a while, but we are getting quite close. Um, and then there's also work that has to go on to the engineering guidelines. So there's, we've identified a bunch of work that needs to be written terms of, and for example, as we migrate from a current Genlock system to the future Genlock system, how do you migrate? So there'll be some engineering guidelines and migration, there'll be some other ones. When you're setting all the networking stuff, there's a lot of um, complexities there, so there'll be some guidelines in terms of some of the networking stuff. Okay, that's all I had on networking. Any questions? Did I answer your question that you asked about the 2022? Anything else on the networking ones? Yes, Ryan. Um, on the SIFT 2022, does this standard define, you know, other than running on 10 DB, leave any internet, does it also define like a 40 and a 100 as well? Actually, it doesn't define any of that because it's actually video over IP and not over Ethernet. So it doesn't actually, so it doesn't, it doesn't it's not, it's not deal with defining the, the it, bandwidth. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a very generic standard that way. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Paul, who's going to has a, a little bit on some other networking standards, and then we'll get into some uh, some of the ultra high def stuff. But first, may I thank you and congratulate you, and offer you this little memento of our appreciation for your presentation. <laughs> Now we have Paul. Um, so Paul began his career in the broadcast industry back in 1980 at the CBC Center, specializing in the area, sorry, especially in the, in the arena of digital television. He was one of the designers of the Broadcast Center, which we talked about. Sorry, that was um, Let's see. Um, prior to CBC, uh, he was involved in some technology startups, provided system and product level design consultation on to various clients. He jumped ship from CPC in 94 to lead technology as a product engineer to designing products for the digital era. For his 19 years at Leach, now Harris Broadcast, he was a project leader, development group leader, R&D manager, manager of strategic engineering, and principal engineer. He left Harris Broadcast in November of 2013, and he now provides system Systems, technology, and standards consultation to the evolving industry. He has several patents granted in the process. He's an active participant in the standards committees. He's our chair of our local section. He's a lifetime amateur radio uh, operator. He's an avid curler in the winter, a cyclist, and a gardener in the summer. And here's Paul. Thank you, Lee. And not as avid as you as a curler, but uh, actually curled Lee. And uh, gets a ton of fun. Uh, thank you, Lee. Before I get to the study group on the HTTP ecosystem, I just wanted to add something because Lee, um, Lee explained a couple of things that together actually are the watershed of our industry. Uh, SIFT 2022 now puts baseband video onto IP packets, and SIFT 29 allows synchronization to be delivered across an IP network. And these two things together 
now allow us to build or, or will enable us to design and build systems that are fully network based live production systems, baseband uncompressed. So we're, we're ready to really keen spot in the industry. I'm going to talk about one more standard, which is not a SIMPI standard, uh, and I'll mention a, a fourth one, also not a SIMPI standard, but these things all together really represent the momentum of us moving away from SDI and hardwired nail up infrastructures and moving to network media infrastructures. Um, I was, however, handed by Mr. Steckley a brief little write-up on another standard. So I'm going to take the liberty of reading this to you, and I apologize I'm reading it, but it's written. It's a standard called AXF, the Archive Exchange Format. Anybody heard of AXF? Anybody have archives? Anybody care about archives? I think we should. Um, how long does a DVD last? A thousand years? A thousand years? How long do bits last? Well, depending on how you store them, they can last as long as humanity knows about it. So, the bits are important. The media will evolve. So, AXF, uh, well, it's an emerging standard for long-term data tape and disk-based content storage. And I say that today because 50 years from now, people say, did you hear that? Tape, disk, I mean, flash memory now, Lord knows what in the future. For storage preservation and transport, it's a device and technology independent format that supports interoperability among disparate content storage systems and ensures the content's long-term availability no matter how storage or file system technologies evolve. At the most basic level, AXF is an IT-centric file container that can encapsulate any number of any type of files in a fully self-contained and self-describing package. And this is key to how it works, right? Because the thing is standalone and it's not technology dependent. This encapsulated AXF package or object actually contains its own file system, which abstracts the underlying operating system, storage technology, and the original file system of the object. Make sure I get this right here. And its valuable payload. AXF offers all of the functionality of other approaches such as LTFS while overcoming all of their well-known limitations. In addition to its storage and preservation characteristics, AXF can also be used for the fully authenticated track transport of file-based assets via any network topology. It's currently operational at dozens of global organizations helping to store, protect, preserve, and transport many petabytes of the world's most valuable file-based content. AXF is also core to various cloud-based storage, preservation, and IP-based transport services being offered in the market today. You can find more information on the web at openaxf.org. The status of the standard is that the final draft specification was submitted for balloting in December and closed with a 90% approval rating. During the balloting process, 250 comments were received, and the AXF committee is currently working hard to get through them all. Most of the comments received were document process or procedure related, and had little or no material effect on the technology itself. So we're really hopeful, maybe, this all gets resolved and is ready uh, for draft publication ballot by NAD. So that is from uh, Brian Campanotti from Front Porch. Uh, who's involved in that committee. The chair of that committee is a guy named Merrill Weiss. Would love like heck to get Merrill up here one night and just let him talk to you guys for the whole evening. Um, he's an interesting character. If you give him the opportunity, he'll pretty much tell you he invented television, but if you get him off his high horse, he really has had his finger in a lot of very, very important work over the years, and he's a heck of an interesting guy. So maybe sometime we'll get Merrill up here. Yeah, he can twist his rubber arm. He's also a radio hand, so maybe I'll twist his arm on that. So let's bring the evening to a close with a discussion of a few other little things going on. Uh, this is a study group. Study group's purpose in Cynthia is to generate a report. Study groups don't make standards. Study groups figure stuff out and write a report about here's what we think. And here's what we think Cynthia and others maybe need to do next. But it's a guidance committee. And this is on the UHDTV ecosystem. The ecosystem is very important. And you'll see in a second the gap I want to talk to you about. Just graphically, there's our old pictures. I started my career with these pictures here. Looks like I'll probably finish it up somewhere with those other pictures in 4K. And as we've heard from CES, 4K has really taken off in a way 3D didn't. And because it's an evolutionary technology, it's probably going to live and live well. So it's becoming real. Um, it, it's really a natural evolution of television. It's just a times two multiplication of resolution horizontally and vertically, and possibly frame rates too. Um, the consumer electronics business is really having a hard time. HD sets are cost, you know, cost managed down to just about nothing, and the margins are very small. Consumer electronics manufacturers want to make more money. 
Well, if they can print bigger panels and put electronics in to drive them, then they can sell 4K TVs. So in CES, we see a flood of these displays, as Paul explained earlier. And if you go to pretty much any store, you'll see one of these things being demoed. And if you've got time to waste, you can ask the guy, so how do I get this over the year? How, how, how do I watch 4K shows? But I'll leave that to you and don't bother the poor guys. Best Buy and, and Future Shop, same company. They're not in good shape right now. Don't go tease them. <laughs> There's some milestones uh, on the way to this. Um, and I'm not really going to dwell on those. The scariest one's probably at the bottom, however. The one place you can get the best variety of 4K content right now is on YouTube. And it's there, it's real. It's compressed, of course, but it looks really fine and all the pixels are there, as much as they are when you compress. So, in Cinti, we're looking at this stuff, and there are some standards already. In 2012, the ITU published Rec 2020, and we uh, revised SP 36 one to harmonize it with Rec 2020 from the EDU. And then the study group was formed because we realized there's lots of missing pieces. And have to look at implementations and deal with the video. The audio is no longer a problem. Many, many channels of audio is still extremely tiny compared to the video. And as you go to 4K, and as you go beyond that to 8K, the audio becomes really insignificant. So the committee has been holding bi-weekly meetings. Well over 100 members, typically 20 or more on a call. And the goal of the committee is to produce a report, produce use cases, and produce a glossary of terms, because we now have new terms we have to talk about. This is a very much an active effort. And the report was issued, the draft was issued just before IDC in 2013. Alan, do we have a final date for the final report? NAV? It's supposed to be NAV this year. It would make sense they want to release that for NAV. So, the goal is to define the UHD TV ecosystem chart. Let's draw a picture of the whole thing from in there. What's it look like? How does 4K look? Well. Find out what standards are missing and what standards need revision. We need to clarify nomenclature, make sure we're all talking the same language, because of new terminologies that we haven't used before to describe things we've never done. And we need to look at at least the immediate future and use of UHD TV. The focus of this report is on UHD TV 1, which is UHD TV or 4K in the stores, but there is UHD TV 2, which is 8K, it's twice the horizontal vertical resolution of 4K. Um, digital cinema and true 4K are out of scope. This is about television. 4K television or UHD TV one as it's properly called. And to look at real-time and non-real-time infrastructures. So there's the ecosystem chart. And have a look at that and tell me what you see that's different from today's HD ecosystem. Is there anything? It's a trick. Only the title is different. Turns out that when everybody sits down and draws a 4K ecosystem, it looks like a 2K or a HD ecosystem. It's all the same stuff in terms of production and distribution and monetizing, at least for the moment. Now, things on the monetizing side and distribution side are evolving, but they're evolving for 4K the same way they're evolving for 2K. So it turns out things aren't that much different from an ecosystem point of view. Now, what about IP? Interesting problem with IP. 4K, P50, and P60 is going to take a 10 gig stick. If you need 6 gigs of bandwidth to push the video, with associated audio. In Ethernet terms, that means 10 gig Ethernet. There is no anything really between 1 gig and 10 gig Ethernet. And this is an evolving interface in the industry. In the datacom world, 10 gig Ethernet is coming. Um, and IP over 10 gig Ethernet is a logical thing to do. Uh, it's gaining some traction. Today there's problems with cost and there's problems with power. It will be a while before this interface becomes as common as a 10, 100, or even a gig Ethernet. Copper versus fiber. Will we be stuck with fiber on a 10 gig interface? Well, years and years ago, everybody was like, never put multiple gigabits on a coax. But we're now developing standards for SDI to go 100 meters with 6 and 12 gigabits on a piece of bloody old coax. And it turns out you can go almost those distances with 10 gig Ethernet on, on copper as well. So the same old copper infrastructure may live on in time. What about more bits, however? UHD TV 2 requires a minimum of four times the bits of UHD TV 1 for the same frame rate. So we're immediately now looking at a 40 gig Ethernet, which is sort of the next step up in bond of Ethernet, to do UHD TV 2. So there's a lot to be done yet in the network side of the world to catch up. Randy. How do you, when you look at SDI in 4K, P50, 60, that goes kind of to 12. Now I know there's kind of room 
Yeah. Sorry, you're right. Yes, 456 is 12. Yeah, so it's 12. So the thought then is, is there's always a little bit more headroom in SDI, right? Maybe you could squeeze it. Uh, maybe you could fit 50 in 10 to 50. I've heard that. But yeah, I'm just, that that's one little thing I'm kind of seeing is the 10 versus 12 right now. And then are we just going to maybe use a little light compression for the IP and ink? Those are some of the things about the, this next big step with payments, right? right? So, so, so patience for a second. Yeah. Precisely. <laughs> And, and uh, indeed, that's a lie. I tell you a lie. We need six gigabits for 4KP60, and it'll fit in the 10. Well, it's 30. 4KP30, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, 30 will fit. 4KP30, of course, being equivalent to what we broadcast today, yeah. which is HDP, well, 2997, 30, we'll call it. Um, so we have four times the bandwidth required just for the equivalent transport of a 4KP30. One of the problems with 4K is because of the immersivity, Frame rates now are too low for the resolution. We get into now psycho visual problems. So the brain has difficulty with the frame rates at the resolution. So if you get nice and immersed, two times or a little less than screen height for the 4K set, your peripheral vision now starts to see the jerkiness even in P60. So higher frame rates are really like that. But I digress. Oh, frame rates. So discussion topics that are underway right now. Frame rate is a problem. You need higher frame rates, and with higher resolution brings this need for higher frame rate. There's a whole topic for another evening, is the whole peripheral vision, uh, flicker threshold, and so on. The problem with the consumer side of the world is HDMI 1.4 is limited to 30 frames, 0.997, um, at 2K, at HD. So HDMI 1.4 will not do 4K. This is a big problem. HDMI 2.0 is coming. And in fact, I think it just got ratified in September, but it's been coming for several years and this has been a big, big problem for people. So we need to deal with motion smear, motion smear and flicker problems in frame rate, which means we need to look at broadcasting higher and higher frame rates. I won't digress and go into TV sets with their smooth motion view that they all have inside now to take a beautiful cinematic picture and turn into a nauseating swimmy thing. But that's a whole other thing under itself. But we do need to consider what we do with 4K and frame rates. Another problem with 4K, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity problem, and that's color space. We've always used 709 color space in HD. 709 color space looks darn fine on old-fashioned screens and even today's old-fashioned uh, LCD monitors and plasmas. We now support Rec 2020 color space, which is a much wider gamut. So screens that can display brighter colors, more vivid colors, more saturated, more depth, can take advantage of this color space. But how do you convert Color space between old 709 and 2020 is a mystery yet to be solved. It will not be a linear thing. Your 2020 picture on a 709 set has to look correct. Your 709 picture on a 2020 set has to look correct, as do the native formats. So this is a this is a couple of problems that are still being wrestled with. The uh, task force has identified that these have to be, or excuse me, the study group has identified that these require more work. Real time interfaces, well. If you go to uh, 4K, 300 frames per second, 12 bit, 444, uh, 3D, which is two images, you're into a terabit. So this stuff quickly scales up. Uh, that's in the ridiculous end of the spectrum. But 10 years ago, I would have told you, you know, talking about uh, 12 and 24 gigs was also the ridiculous end of the spectrum. And, well, here we are. We have multi link uh, and high speed transports under development, simply as Alan told us about. But in a facility, you really need the single wire interface. It's all fine to have four coaxes to carry your 4K around, but really it's not. It works in a lab, doesn't work in a plant. Nobody's going to build a plant. How many people remember building component video systems with Y? You, yeah, we're right. We're not going back there. Nobody wants to go back there. So the, uh, the single link uh, transport scenarios are very, very important uh, for UH. Also, the move to video over IP or possibly AVB, um, is, a, is a, an interesting evolution, but the bit links become a problem there. So this is something that this committee is not wrestling directly with, but has identified that there is uh, work to be done. And that's in conjunction with the Joint Task Force on Network Media, and where they're going, and obviously, there's going to be some convergence of thinking down the road. There was some talk about compression. So what about putting a 4K picture on today's infrastructure? What kind of compression would you use? Well, the words compression and standard rarely exist in the same sentence. 
there are so many ways to compress and so few of them are standardized. So there may be a possibility for a recommendation to develop a standard for some very light mezzanine compression, simple to implement, cost effective to implement, that would allow the 4K bit rates to be visually lossless within today's HD and 3 gig rates. And then there's 3D. We won't really don't want to go there. It may be 3D goes away completely, or it may be 3D uh, with disparity mapping comes along, and the left eye, right eye thing goes away. There's a lot to be figured out there, both commercially and technically, but if the commercial reality doesn't happen, the technical work doesn't need to be done too quickly. Uh, the report will not discuss audio formats in a great deal of depth, because audio is audio, and there's a whole world of working on audio, and it really isn't a big thing for us for whatever audio and whatever kind of jiggle vision uh, wiggles your butt on the sofa for that matter. Um, that kind of metadata is, is very trivial. And then there's unusual UHDTV apps such as HD uh, extraction or multi screen stitching. That's also out of scope for this group. We have to resolve some legacy issues. And our biggest one is right at the top. Because it's not 30 frames per second, it's 29.97. Because of the excellent decision of the NTSC in 1953. Uh, and the ratification of ATSC in the 80s, I guess, kept that alive. And there may be an opportunity now to actually do away with that forever. Can I applaud here? Can you applaud? Can you applaud? <laughs> well, there's problems. Okay, so you've got 50 years of 29.97 legacy material. Let's say we build a 30 hertz television system. How do you play your content? You get it in frame rate per hertz. Well, yeah, but that. It's going to take you a thousand and one frame, a thousand frames of time to make a thousand and one frames of video. That's computationally ridiculous. What if you play at 0.1% fast? What happens? My answer is nothing. They've been playing movies in Europe at 25 hertz for years. Nobody cares. It just makes the audio pick. So we have an opportunity, and it's a huge discussion right now, and everybody's, everybody's sounding off. My opinion is screw it, let's go to integer frame rates, and all your archive footage plays a tiny, tiny bit fast. Your modern content plays on the old legacy systems, 0.1% slow. Big deal. Non-constant luminance has been discussed. Does anybody know about non-constant or constant luminance? Oh, thank God. Neither do I. Uh, <laughs> it's a subtlety to television imagery. Um, we have non-constant luminance in our current television systems. Theoretically, um, the right way to do it is with what's called constant luminance, and that's a theoretical right, the best kind of right. And in this case, uh, enough people have sounded off to say, no, we really don't want to go there. It's complexity that brings no real material benefit anywhere in the system. And then synchronization of time code, well, thankfully, the recommendation will be to get rid of color black and all that stuff and use the new stuff based on SIPI 2059, the network delivery time code. And uh, okay. and we need, obviously, to deal with higher frame rate time code, because right now we're maxed right out at 60. Audio, well, we have a 22 channel. I guess yeah, that's true. We are maxed out of 30, you're right. Um, so we have a standard for 22.2 channel sound. So this group needs to do no additional work on audio. The audio goes along with the video. We can keep it synchronized, we're happy. Um, there are issues around things such as the number of size placing the speakers, and then under the hood, things about channel mapping, perhaps object based uh, encoding schemes, and overall audio immersivity are things that need to be discussed, but this report is not going to be on those subjects. There is a gap, however. So what can you buy today? Well, you can buy everything on the left-hand column, and you can buy everything on the right-hand column. What you can't buy is everything in the middle. Fortunately, I mean, on day one of television, that was the system. There was a wire between left and right. Uh, today, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's acquisition, there's OB vans, ENG vans, there's studio ingest facilities, there's studio production facilities, there's master controls, and there's storage firms, uh, there's distribution systems, there's a whole big thing missing from the middle. So when you go to the Best Buy and you say to the guy, so what can I watch? You might take this slide with you and say, you did, can you tell me what's in the middle? I, I don't know what to sell you. <laughs> but some things are improving. HDMI 2.0 was released, finally. So we can get up to 18 gigabits now, we can support higher rates. Um, and these are the features of HDMI 2.0. I'm not gonna let you read that for a great deal longer. But finally, it's come to bear. And this means the manufacturers can now bring the sets out. There's 21 by 9. Oh, yeah, it supports, yeah. it signals 21 by 9. Got to remember, these consumer folks don't really talk to us, simply folks, except to officially be liaison. So 
a lot of work gets done and we go home. Okay? And I'm sure vice versa. Despite us trying very, very hard. So now for consumer equipment to the display, we have a path. This is really important. But you're not going to wire every TV station with HDMI. You may wire certain equipment, and they probably do. In fact, today you probably take HDMI out of a camera somewhere in some little box built by vendor X, Y, or Z, and out comes HDSDI. In fact, you can go into recorders and link equipment now with HDMI as well, but let's face it, you're not going to build a studio. So, we have the 6 gig and 12 gig standards coming, and we also have this wonderful thing called 10 gig Ethernet, which I mentioned earlier, which provides the necessary bandwidth to get a lot of what we want. And this provides us possibly with a good single hose solution, and not just like SDI, where you get video and audio on the hose, but really rich service capabilities, bi-directionality for one thing. So the video, audio, the intercom, the IFD, they can all live on the one hose. Your camera control, your pan tilt zoom, can all live on the same hose. Device control, the devices you have at the end of that hose. Imagine doing a newsstand up out on the street. One Ethernet cable. All this stuff, you don't even have the cameraman down there, you got a pan tilt zoom from upstairs. Send the Genlock down, you can put a reasonable amount of power over PoE. You can put network services of all manner on there, so they have email and messaging and all the stuff that everybody else wants. And media access, archiving and editing, and all of the stuff you do on a daily basis. All this potentially on a single host. So this is really powerful if we can figure out how to use networks. That's kind of two steps away from the UHD TV realm. Today we're talking about that more in the 2K realm. But obviously, how many people remember dial-up modems? How many people have 10 or 20 megabit DSL today? It won't be long, right? The SDI side, I stole this nice little chart which just shows the ridiculously escalating bit rates as the resolutions and the frame rates go up. And this is why we need our 6 and 12 gig SDI standards and why there'll be more beyond that, I'm quite sure. So closing the gap, we have 6 and 12 gig of SDI. We have IP and Ethernet now coming to the table and being usable. We have HDMI 2.0. Uh, we have HEV 